the future. It says that some people are being removed from the meeting, which is a little bit weird. Okay. Well, for those with small monitors, you can change that. Okay. Now, for the for those of you that are can see everything, is the layout pretty good? You can see the slides well. Okay. Did you all get a chance to watch the online lecture? Now, the online lecture was designed to um, introduce the topic and then go through the first um, sort of uh, information, so that way we can carry on with the more difficult stuff sort of in person. Okay. So. Is there any specific questions in relation to material from the asynchronous lecture, from the online lecture? Okay, good. The quiz isn't meant to be difficult. The quiz is mostly um, just to motivate you to um, complete the asynchronous lecture, to come into the like, synchronous lecture with a little bit of a knowledge base. So it makes it easier for A to me for teach, but also for you to learn. Cool. Cool. It, the, the point is to be pretty straightforward um, and not to be difficult. Again, just to um, sort of hit the, the main points that would be the most important to sort of understand moving into um, today's lecture. If I, can you see me switching the, um, the slides, everyone? Perfect, okay. So let's get started. So through the asynchronous lecture, we introduced the idea of the cerebrum. And we learned about the different parts of um, the cerebrum and the different lobes and how each lobe is specific to um, different functions. We finished off with talking about um, the tracks, which represent the groupings of, white, of axons from neurons that go in and out of the brain through the spinal cord. In today's lecture, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be specifically talking about the function of the neurological system or the, the neurologicism that functions specifically for controlling movement. Now, the topic of the course is intro to movement neuroscience. And so we're learning a neuroscience course or we're learning the science of the neurological system with a focus on understanding how humans control movement. Now, recognize that when we decide to move, when we make purposeful movements, we voluntarily move our bodies to interact with um, the world in the way that we would want to. That um, information or that control is um, performed from the top down. So we develop a decision to um, create a movement in our prefrontal cortex. And so if you, can you guys see the, the cursor on the screen? That way it's like a, what I'm pointing at. Perfect, okay. So initially we make that decision to move in areas of the prefrontal cortex. So the, the front end, this is the front, the front end of the brain. And so we're going to decide um, how to move based on our sensory information, based on um, what we decide we need to do and our motivations. But what's gonna happen is that that information is gonna be sent to our uh, motor planning areas. And it's these three motor planning areas that coordinate what axons to, um, or what neurons to fire to flex specific muscles in a certain way to interact with the environment as we see fit. Yeah, sorry about that, Brittany. It did take a lot of people to get in here. So um, these are the three areas that we're gonna learn about. They are the primary motor cortex, the premotor cortex, and the supplementary motor cortex. You can see them on the slide here. We have the primary motor cortex, supplementary and premotor cortex. And these are the three motor planning areas that we're gonna be talking about today that are utilized in developing um, the specific activation pattern of our muscles to move our body in the way that we um, would like it to. Ultimately, what happens is that when we decide um, to move in a certain way, the motor planning areas send that information through the motor cortex through the brainstem out to the spinal cord, and then the ultimate destination of those uh, action potentials is our muscles. And depending on how we contract them, we move our bodies in the way that we want. Yes, this, this um, lecture will be recorded. So let's first talk about the primary motor cortex. Now it is located in the frontal lobe anterior to the central sulcus. Now, if you remember from the asynchronous lecture, the central sulcus runs laterally 
over the top of both hemispheres of the cerebrum. And so in the slide, this would be the central sulcus here. So the central sulcus divides everything in front, which is motor, and everything behind is sensory. So it divides motor from sensory. The primary motor cortex is located right directly anterior to the central sulcus. And this area is involved specifically with the initiation and coordination of voluntary movements, specifically for fine motor skills. So those skills that require a lot of fine control. Now, think of our body. What would you say is the areas that require or utilize the most um, fine control, most small and dexterous movements? For sure, the face and the fingers. So the fingers, for sure, like think about all the different things that we manipulate. In fact, the use of our hands is what sort of um, categorizes us or distinguishes us as humans, our ability to, um, to manipulate our environment. The other thing is our face. And if you'd look at, like in terms of like a communication, um, nonverbal cues, if you think of animals, nonverbal cues is, a, is the majority of how we communicate. Like if I tell you, um, welcome to lecture versus welcome to lecture, it's two different sort of like um, ways to interpret that. And that's because of nonverbal cues. And the way that we evolve from animals, think of like dogs and the look on their face to um, apes to humans, so much of how we communicate is through um, how we um, have our facial features. And so that's why there's a large um, control or fine control of our face. Our primary motor uh, cortex, so that's one of the uh, motor planning areas, is organized into what's called a motor homunculus. So a motor homunculus is a graphical representation of the area of the primary motor cortex that's associated with a particular part of the body. So here we have a cross section through the brain looking at the primary motor cortex. You can see that there's a graphical, graphical representation of the body over top of the cerebrum. Now, what do you notice about this picture in terms of um, the size of the different parts of the body? Anyone? Someone type. Someone type to make sure it didn't freeze. Perfect. Okay. The hand in the face, we have a answer from Warren. The hand in the face is the largest, and that's exactly true. We have a larger representation in the primary motor cortex for the hand and the face. Now, why would you think that that is? If the gray matter of the cerebrum, but in this case, the primary motor cortex represents all different neurons, we have a larger surface area devoted to the areas that require the finest control. So by having a larger surface area of the primary cortex devoted to the face and to the hands, we have more control over that. We have a larger number of neurons or motor neurons that go to the face and to the hand, and that allows for finer control. Think of like a marionette. Uh, which is like a puppet with the strings. A marionette that had four strings would have a certain number of uh, amount of control versus one that had 16 strings, like the professional ones. You can do a lot more. Same idea with uh, the primary, cor primary motor cortex and um, the neurons going to the face and to the hands. Now, clinically, what would happen if this area was damaged? And that can happen through any type of lesion, whether it be um, like an aneurysm or a traumatic brain injury, um, such as a concussion, what happens if this area of the brain is damaged? And what we found, and this was through, um, it's kind of sad, but monkey studies where they would damage parts of the brain and see what happens. If we have a lesion or damage to the primary motor cortex, what happens is that we have a loss of fine control or voluntary control of that part of the body on the contralateral side of the part of the body. So you, you may not know this yet, um, but we have our right primary motor cortex, or the right part of the brain controlling the left side of the body, and vice versa. So if you were to damage part of the right primary motor cortex, you're going to lose function of the left side of the body. Okay? Does everyone understand that? That the, the neurons for um, motor and sensory cross? So left part of the brain, right side of the body, right brain, left body. Okay. 
A lot of non-invasive studies use what's called transcranial magnetic stimulation. Instead of just like putting lesions and injuring humans' brains that wouldn't pass in research, what they do is they have a TMS device. And what that does is it uses a uh, magnet or magnet stimulation to um, either excite or inhibit parts of the brain. And then, for example, we can see in the study here, you could use this wand and hit parts of the brain and then have someone perform a function and look at how it was altered as a result of inhibiting that part of the brain. And I bring this up because this is what we use in uh, the neuroscience labs at Ontario Tech. So we talked about the primary motor cortex. And again, remember there's three motor planning areas that we're gonna be talking about today in lecture. The second one is what's called the pre-motor area. This is the smaller picture depicting the motor planning areas um, than what that was in the previous slides. But here we have the cerebrum. We have the primary motor cortex directly in front of the primary motor cortex. And uh, inferior, we have the pre-motor area. Now, the pre-motor area is involved in organizing movements before they are initiated. So if our primary motor cortex is for fine control, what happens is that the premotor area is involved with activating large muscle group movements um, like trunk and girdle muscles and uh, postural muscles to um, keep our balance while we are completing the fine control. Now think about if I wanted to play the piano, if I'm gonna reach, or let's say I'm gonna type right now. If I wanna type on the keyboard, I have to be stable so I can perform that um, fine control of my fingers. That means before I initiate the movement, my core muscles have to activate to provide stability. And that's what the premotor area does. It activates muscles prior to the initiation of fine control to make sure that our body is stable. And depending on what movements we want to do, whether it is like swinging a baseball or reaching for a cup or raising your hand, it's gonna depend on what movement we want to do. That's going to depict or, or decide on um, what postural muscles and how to activate um, those specific postural, postural muscles. Okay. Now, the other thing that the uh, premotor area does is that it, um, and they've learned this through research, is that it um, receives input from sensory cues. So remember how we have to decide, um, or we have to be aware of how we are in space to understand what was required to voluntarily move in the way that we want. We need to be aware of our environment before we can voluntarily interact with our environment, if that makes sense. Um, and so what they figured out was that this premotor area also has this use where with watching demonstrations, if you think of looking at uh, kids, for example, or even in sporting techniques, what's the quickest way to learn a sport or um, a task? You watch someone demonstrate or you watch someone perform a specific task, and then you tend to sort of like learn those motor patterns through vision. The part of the brain that's responsible in sort of taking demonstration and putting it into um, our awareness is the premotor area. And then the way that they figured that out was that um, they did those same monkey studies. Um, and what they did was they found that once they damaged the premotor cortex of these monkeys, they were unable to learn demonstration movements. They were still able to perform fine control, but if they were to show the monkey, this is how you grab for the food, it wouldn't learn that. It would have to sort of through trial and error figure it out itself. So uh, we had a question from Evan. Would the premotor area still activate if we were um, already in a stable position to perform a fine movement? Um, no, because think about like, so if I'm stable right now, once I reach, the more I reach, the more my back muscles are going to activate or else I'm going to fall over. So depending on our movements, that like, this, is a, this is fluid. It's not just one activation, it's a fluid process. So it's constantly adjusting our stability muscles to, um, work with the positions that we're moving into. Got it, Evan? Okay, cool. Any other questions, guys? Okay. Oops. Awesome. Okay. Brittany wants to know, why did the U.S. ban TikTok? Apparently, um, you can still have it. You just can't re-download it. You can't download it anymore. Okay. The next motor planning area, the third one, is the supplementary motor area, okay? The supplementary motor area 
is located just above our premotor cortex. So we have our primary motor cortex, fine control. We have our premotor area, which is for postural muscles. Our supplementary motor area, which is located um, just above the premotor cortex. This is a view from the medial side, so it would actually wraps around like inside um, the uh, longitudinal fissure. The supplementary motor area is essential um, for coordinating sequential movements and bimanual movements. So what that means is that the supplementary motor area is important in coordinating um, those tasks that involve the use of both hands, specifically like playing guitar where the two hands are coordinated but not doing the same thing, like not doing the same motions. Um, another example would be like playing the piano that are you have different notes. The supplementary motor area is responsible for coordinating the actions between the two. Uh, yeah. Uh, question, is there a quiz at the end of this lecture other than, no, there will, the, the quiz is just on the asynchronous lecture. Literally the quiz is to make sure that you guys watch the asynchronous lecture, okay? Any questions about the supplementary motor area? So it's for coordinating movements involving both hands. And also um, think about when uh, we play the piano. People that play the piano, they're reading the notes ahead of, that are coming up. And so what they noticed in research was that pianists would alter their hand positions based on the notes that were coming up. So for example, I don't know if you can see my hands, but for example, let's say there was a high note coming up. They would subconsciously alter their finger position to make sure that they would hit that high note. And so the area of the brain that's coordinating how to do that in real time or sequential movement, that's the supplementary motor area. And what they figured that out um, or how they figured that out was again through um, monkey studies where they found that um, in this study, they had a monkey um, and what it had to do was to get food, it had to reach from a bowl, grab uh, food, drop it through a hole because it, there was a table and it couldn't um, reach with the other hand um, and drop the food and then it would be able to take that food and put it into its mouth. Once they damaged the brain in the supplementary motor area, the, um, the monkeys couldn't coordinate that. Okay, perfect. So that, those, the motor planning areas that we uh, just learned about, those are located anterior to the central sulcus. Posterior to the central sulcus or directly posterior to the central sulcus is our primary somatosensory area, okay? This is organized in a sensory homunculus. Now, what do you notice about the sensory homunculus? Anything different about it compared to the motor one? It looks fairly similar. There's a greater representation for the tongue, and that's because of our se sense of uh, like taste. Um, but what we see is that there is more like uh, ability for fine uh, sensory or sense of touch um, and discriminative um, sensation in the hand and the face, just like in the motor homunculus. Okay, so the primary somatosensory area. This is the area that all of the sensory nerves are going to go into for conscious perception of fine touch, proprioception, um, vibration, um, and uh, pain and temperature. So discriminative touch is when if you close your eyes and then someone touches you somewhere, you're aware of where that happened. Or if you are brushing up against a wall and let's say that there's a nail sticking out of the wall and it stabs you, you're going to feel about where that sensation was. That's the sensation of pain versus if someone um, like caresses you or tickles you, you're going to feel where that is. That is discriminative touch. So you are able to localize where that sense is coming from. That's as a result of the primary somatosensory area. All of those sensory neurons, in this case, are coming up towards the brain. So they're afferent axons. They end up in this area of the brain. This area of the brain is located directly inferior to the central sulcus. Now, who remembers from the previous lecture, the sensory uh, neurons that are coming into the spinal cord, do they enter through the back or the front? Yep. So that's why when it says in the slide, the afferent pathways are located in the dorsal spinal cord. So all of that information is coming up the dorsal or the back end of the spinal cord, and it ends up in our primary um, sensory area.
Here we have another depiction of the sensory homunculus. And the point of this slide is to think about um, what would happen if we have a lesion in a specific area of the primary somatosensory area. What do you guys think would happen? we would lose the sensation of touch from that area of the body. We would be able to, we would not be able to discriminate um, senses of fine touch, proprioception, vibration, pain and temperature in that part of the body. So whatever part of the body was uh, of the primary um, somatosensory area, whatever part of that area was injured, we would, the part of the body associated with that area we would lose our discriminative um, ability to uh, feel those senses. Perfect. So those were the motor planning areas, our primary sensory area, right? The next thing that we're gonna talk about is the basal ganglia. Has anyone ever heard about that before? The term basal ganglia means a collection of cell bodies. Here we can see what it looks like. It's located in the brain. So let me go up a slide. Can you guys see how, so in, re, in purple here, this would be what the um, basal ganglia looks like. So you see how it's like a, a, a let me go back two slides. So see how it's a collection of um, sort of like groupings of nuclei that are clumped together and then the way it's situated is that everything coming out and in from the brain has to go through the basal ganglia. The function of the basal ganglia um, is to um, sort of coordinate uh, movement. So what it does is, um, and it's necessary for proper control, um, it allows us to have smooth movement. It regulates um, our movement patterns by taking all of the information that's coming from the motor planning areas, all of the efferent information that's going down into the spinal cord, what the basal ganglia does is it regulates that to ensure that those movement patterns would be smooth. So what it does is that adjusts the force levels of the different muscles that you want to activate to make sure that the movement that you produce is smooth and fluid. And these are the actual um, uh, names of the, basal, of the ganglia that are in the basal ganglia. You won't need to know that for the exam, okay? I'm just putting it out there because when we get to this lecture in um, lecture seven, then we will be discussing it, okay? But the reason why they know what the basal ganglia does is they looked at disorders that um, affect the basal ganglia. So you will not need to know it, Andrew. So for the class, you won't need to know that the individual um, basal ganglia um, words, just know the function for this, uh, the purpose of this midterm. And so anyway, gonna get back to what the basal ganglia does, is they know what it does because of um, looking at the symptoms in people that have um, injuries or conditions of the basal ganglia. The big one is Parkinson's disease. So what happens, what is a, a, a tall tale sign of someone with Parkinson's disease? If anyone knows or is a, you know, uh, knows someone that had it. Yeah, exactly. So they move slow, they shake, they have very jerky movement patterns. And that's because they aren't regulating their movement. So that's how we know what basal ganglia does. There's other basal ganglia disorders, but that was the big one. The next part of uh, the brain that we're gonna be discussing is the cerebellum. Am I going too fast or you guys okay? I just wanna highlight the different parts of the brain um, just to un ensure that you guys understand how they're involved in movement. So we have the motor planning areas. Those are for coordinating which muscles to activate. The primary somatosensory area, so that we're aware of our environment senses. Um, the basal ganglia is for regulating movement patterns um, to make sure that they're smooth. Whereas the cerebellum, the cerebellum is involved in um, coordination of movement. So here we have a slide depicting what uh, the cerebellum looks like. So you see how it looks like a little brain? Cerebellum is Latin for little brain. And it's located at the base of the brain right here, attached to the brainstem. It is also divided up into um, gray matter and white matter. 
And because it has such smaller folds, it actually contains 50% of the neurons total of our brain. So because of the smaller folds, it's able to contain so much uh, of the neurons and therefore information. Here we have what it looks like from the front and the bottom. So it, it's hard to actually see. Um, oh, we have a question. Is, uh, is it a deterioration of basal ganglia that causes these disorders or damage to? Um, it, it, well, depending on the disorder, um, you have a degeneration of these areas. So um, Parkinson's, they're not really sure why it happens. There's a like sort of a genetic component. Huntington's is a genetic uh, disorder that leads to a buildup of proteins that damage specifically the basal ganglia. Um, things like um, concussions or repeated concussions that lead to um, like punch drunk syndrome. Um, they're thinking that that is uh, energy loss in actually the basal ganglia. So there's, there's different things that can um, lead to um, a destruction of specifically the basal ganglia. But what happens is that when it's that area of the brain that's damaged, the symptomology um, presents the same. So the mechanism might be different, but if that's the part of the brain that's damaged, the symptoms of the person that you would see in the person um, being affected would be the same. Are you guys okay? You're welcome. That was for Josh, but hopefully that you guys, that was just a question. So hopefully you guys can um, sort of follow along with what I was, I was discussing. Um, one thing that I, um, I get a lot is that the cerebellum, if you look at it, it looks, it looks like a brain, so it's hard to sort of distinguish. Um, the biggest difference, uh, other than size, obviously, is that if you look down the midline of the cerebellum, instead of having like a, a longitudinal fissure, there's a ridge, and that's called the vermis. It's called the midline vermis. So instead of like a big line, if there's a bit of a ridge, it looks like a worm. Vermis means worm in Latin, so that's why they call it that. That's a good way to sort of distinguish what you're sort of looking at. Oops. So in terms of the functions, like I said, the main function of the cerebellum is to coordinate uh, movement and postural control. It's involved in maintaining balance and equilibrium. Um, and then what it does is that because it has so much neurons, what happens functionally is that all of our sensory information um, goes first in through the cerebellum. So what it does is that it integrates lots of sensory and motor information and looks at what we want to do versus how we did it and helps sort of alter um, our movement patterns by changing the coordination of our movements. So um, that sounds really difficult, but think about a child when they're learning to kick a ball or learning to do any sport. A beginner always looks uncoordinated, right? their movements are all broken up. They have a hard time really focusing on what they're doing. But then as they get better through repetition and repetition and repetition of the same task, their movements become more fluid and they become better at doing that specific task. Can we all agree? The area of the brain that's responsible for learning and coordinating those movement patterns is the cerebellum. The input into the cerebellum is all of our sensory, all of our proprioception information goes into the cerebellum as well as all of the information of what muscles were contrasting, contracting in, that re in real time goes through the cerebellum as well. So what it's doing is it's comparing what we're wanting to do versus what muscles we contracted and figuring out how to alter the coordination or the timing of our movements to make sure that it's, um, we're achieving the goal of the specific task. So in this case, we were talking about kicking a ball to make sure that we're lining up the movement of our hip, knee, and ankle at the right time to make sure that we get the benefit, the, you know, the, the biggest kick or whatever the goal of uh, the task is. Right. So, so for Muhammad, so we have a question. So, would the basal ganglia be more responsible for smooth movements, whereas the cerebellum is uh, more for movement coordination? It would be that um, the basal, yes, specifically that. The basal ganglia regulates uh, the amount you contract each muscle to make sure that it moves fluid. The cerebellum cannot change how much we contract the muscles. It, can it changes the timing of the muscle contractions. So intensity versus timing. Now, we have, now, we have a full lecture dedicated to the cerebellum on lecture eight, but I just wanted to introduce it so that way you're um, sort of familiar as we follow along through the course. 
Awesome. Okay. Almost done, guys. Um, the next area of uh, the central nervous system or the brain that we're going to be talking about is the brainstem. Now, the brainstem is the evolutionarily older um, area of the brain. Um, in humans, the cerebrum and cerebellum is what's evolved the most. So a lot of um, lesser ordered mammals, all we all have brain stems, which have similar looking parts. The brain stem is located, or it looks like this from the front and looks like this from behind. Now there's different areas of the brain stem that are sort of combined together. Those include the medulla, which are at the bottom. So does anyone oh, remember the water boy? You guys are probably too young to remember that movie. But there's a joke about the medulla omologata. So that's the medulla. There's the pons and the midbrain. And those are grouped together to create what's called our brain stem. Now, the brain stem, in terms of functions, contains all of the sensory and motor tracts. Remember, tracts are groupings of wires. So axons are what creates the actual potentials that either go um, from the brain down or from the body up to the brain. Now, the brain stem is going to contain all of those tracts traveling to and from um, the spinal cord and brain. The brain stem has reflex centers that are responsible for um, equilibrium and head orientation to visual and auditory stimuli. The pons is the connection site for the cerebellum. The brain stem is also the emerging site for most of our cranial nerves. Um, Joshua was informed that he has seen the water boy, so that was pretty funny, Adam Sandler. Um, the neurons that we talked about, or sorry, the spinal nerves that we talked about last class. So remember how there was um, at every level of the vertebra, there's two spinal nerves that exit from each side. And then we have sensory information going to the back end of the, uh, the spinal cord, motor information leaving from um, the front end. That is for all the neurons or all of the uh, nerves that go to our body. The cranial nerves are those um, for senses in our head. And those are all emerging from not the um, spinal cord, but they emerge from the brainstem. And the last thing that the um, brainstem is responsible for is our um, sort of it's regulating our vital functions. So things like swallowing, respiration, heart rate, and temperature, all of our regulatory processes are handled in the brainstem. And because a lot of mammals can do that, it makes sense that that's the evolutionarily older um, area of our brain. Question, do we need to know the specific functions in each part of the brainstem or just know the general function? No, I would know the, so for the purposes of the midterm, you would want to know um, the purpose of each. They're not, um, they're not uh, very difficult. So we'll go through them individually now. Quite, we had a question from Jordan. Uh, I'm just curious, how does the basal ganglia relate to the Golgi tendon organ reflex in muscles? Now, um, actually, the Golgi tendon organ reflex is through uh, the spinal cord. And so we'll learn about that. Um, that's through, uh, so not a lot. Uh, we have a question. Andrew says, you previously had said the basal ganglia controls how much you contract the muscle uh, and cerebellum controls how long. No, no, the cerebellum controls the timing, like uh, the order in which, like, so, um, uh, like the order in which you activate the muscles. Does that make sense, Andrew? You sure? Perfect. Okay, awesome. So, um, sorry, just back to um, Jessica. So let's go through the individual parts of the brainstem um, and then discuss what each does. Here we have uh, a diagram just showing the cranial nerve. So these are not the neurons that are the nerves that are going to the body. These are the ones that are sensory and motor that are going to the head and face and neck. So they're in yellow. And you can see that they all sort of emerge from um, the brainstem. So let's first start off with the midbrain. So let's look at this diagram here. We have the medulla, we have the pons, and then we have the midbrain. So the midbrain is the most superior of the brainstem, or the most superior part of the brainstem. And it is formed by two, peduncles means like stalks. So we would have our cerebrum attached on either side. So look at my cursor. The cerebrum would be right here. So right side attached to one peduncle, 
the other side attached to the other peduncle, and this would create what's called our midbrain, okay? Now, in terms of its um, sort of use in movement, the big thing that the midbrain does is that it contains, uh, oops, it contains the superior and inferior colliculi, which are groups of neurons. So you can see these two bumps. That's the superior colliculi. This is the inferior colliculi. And they are reflexes that are involved, um, that involve our head orientation to visual and auditory stimuli. So question, you are walking along and you hear a loud noise. Automatically, what do you do? So in class, what I used to do was have someone light a firecracker and then uh, everyone would turn and look. So unfortunately we can't do that because this is virtual. But um, hopefully you can like think of a time where you hear a car accident or you see a bright, like light lightning, for example. Loud noises and very bright things naturally draw our attention and we naturally turn our head to that area. Would we all agree on that? Oh, perfect. So, um, and so the area of the, that's not conscious. Like it's not, that's not us voluntarily being like, oh, I heard something, I better look. That just happens. The area of the brain that's responsible for those reflexes is the uh, superior and inferior click So that's the brainstem. The superior colliculi are for visual, and then the inferior colliculi, uh, inferior colliculi sorry, are for the auditory stimuli. The pons, um, so that's, oops, um, I don't have, okay, the pons is specifically for just um, the connection of our cerebellum. And then the midbrain is the, air, sorry, the medulla is the area of the brain that is responsible for those um, like vital functions. So here we have the rest of the midbrain and the pons taken off. And we have just the medulla. So there's some cranial nerves that exit from the medulla. It contains all of the sensory and motor tracts that are going up and down the spinal cord. But it also has the groupings of nuclei that are responsible for all of those like regulatory functions. So respiration, heart rate, temperature, and um, like reflexes like coughing and sneezing and vomiting. Oh, um, I had a, a question from uh, Kristen. She says, what is a peduncle? A peduncle is just a Latin word for meaning like a, like a stalk or like a trunk. So the peduncles of the midbrain are like, it looks like two stalks that connect the two cerebrum um, halves to the palms or to the brainstem. Is that okay, Kristen? Perfect. You guys okay with the medulla? So just to reiterate what Jessica said, yes, you do need to know what the parts of the brainstem do. The uh, midbrain is to hold the cerebrum or connected to the brainstem, but it also has those reflex centers, the superior and inferior colliculi. The um, pons is the connection site for the cerebellum. And then the medulla is the um, area that contains all of our um, ability to do our regulatory autonomic functions. The pons, and sorry, Maya, the pons uh, connects the cerebellum to the brainstem. So if you look at this slide here, so pons, see how it just connects to the cerebellum? Cool. Is everyone okay? Let me just go through the chat. You guys okay to, um, to continue? So that was the areas of the brain that you need to know about. Um, I, I obviously um, discussed the motor planning areas as well as the sensory area in more depth. And, that, and that's specifically because of, you know, our course is to understand the central nervous system, but how it pertains to movement as kinesiology grads. We discussed the uh, basal ganglia and how it's responsible for um, regulating the amount that we activate our muscles to ensure that it's smooth movement. Our cerebellum is responsible for learning um, and storing the synchronization or timing of our movements. 
um, for coordination. And then our brainstem is for um, evolutionary older processes. So there's reflex centers as well as it holds the cerebellum and it has um, those areas for um, regulation of our autonomic function. Now, one interesting thing to note is that um, in terms of blood flow to the brain, there is a blood brain barrier. And have you guys ever heard that um, term before? That means that our blood doesn't specifically get into our brain. What happens is that we have this network of um, vessels that surround the brain, and then all of um, the metabolites and all of um, the things that our brain needs have to diffuse from the blood into um, the brain tissue and then is bathed in cerebral spinal fluid. So remember last day we were talking about how cerebral spinal fluid bathes both the um, cerebrum, the brain, and the spinal cord. Blood is separate from that. What happens is that the blood goes through vessels that are close to um, that area, and then the metabolites and um, you know, like the nutrients must diffuse out, and then the waste products diffuse, sorry, must diffuse into the um, nervous tissue, whereas all the waste products must diffuse out. And so what that does is that it separates all of the things that are in our blood from what's going on in our cerebral spinal fluid or our central nervous system. So it keeps it very, very separate. And the way that it does that is through um, sort of uh, the vessels are um, have a semi-permeable um, sort of covering that would limit um, what's allowed to cross through that. This is just a color-coded diagram depicting the different things that we talked about. And then so at the, for the end of the course, you should be able to sort of understand um, like what each of the um, areas are. So sorry, sorry, not the end of the course, the end of the lecture, sorry. Um, this is just sort of an overview of what each is responsible for. So the areas that we talked about um, are responsible for. We didn't touch on the thalamus. But um, just to go over briefly in case uh, you guys want to know, um, the thalamus is um, located just in from the basal ganglia and all neurons that go in and out of the brain must first go through the thalamus. The thalamus is like the railroad tracks, like the, the relay center. So if you think of like the tracks that switch in a railroad station, as the analogy I like to think about, um, that's the what the thalamus is like. Everything that goes in and out of the brain must first go through the thalamus. And then the hypothalamus is for um, the release of hormones. Perfect. So um, we're almost done the lecture. Hopefully it's not too much. So quickly before we just finish off with concussions, is there anything in the material? I know that the format's sort of um, weird with going virtual. Um, and it's, it's not as interactive as I would like it to be like it was in person. Uh, now we're using Google Meets, which has limited function. But I just wanted to make sure that all of you guys are sort of um, following along with what I'm talking about, um, that the pace is going well, that you can hear me clearly, and that I'm presenting the material in a way that you can at least sort of follow along with. So Paula says the audio quality is better. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, like I, I, that's, so I mean, I, I don't want to change it, but I haven't cut out yet. So, so far it's been pretty good. And I'm recording it too, right? So I really just sort of like emphasize that, again, this isn't an ideal situation. Um, hopefully the pandemic ends at some point, um, but I am recording the lectures so that you can review it. And if you have any questions, just ask me. Okay. Is everyone okay for me just to finish off the lecture? Brittany says that there's 401 new corona cases today. That's perfect. Should, should I continue on? You guys okay for me to continue? Okay, perfect. So let's finish off with concussions. Here we go. So originally, yeah, like concussions are huge now, right? But you know, like 10 years ago, not a lot was really known about concussions. And ultimately, I don't know if you guys are still being taught this, but um, really people thought that a concussion was when, you know, you hit your head and then the brain would rattle around and bang off the skull. That's not actually what happens. Um, with a uh, concussion or what's like sort of diagnosed as, the other term is mild traumatic brain injury. 
It's obviously defined as a brief loss of normal function, of normal brain function, um, resulting from a hit to the head. Now, um, the problem with concussions is that it can happen without hitting your head. It can happen as a result of like a car accident where you don't hit your head, but like heavy acceleration. Think about like in hockey, right? Someone can get checked, doesn't hit their head, but they can still get a concussion. So it involves high accelerations where the head is moving. Now that the problem with concussions is that when we have like a sickness, there's usually a test that you can create to determine whether or not someone has a disorder. So either you look at like, you know, like what the, the virus, or you look at the antibodies or, you know, the chemical markers. The problem with concussions is that there is no sort of like underlying imaging that proves or disproves that there a concussion has happened. There's no bleeding, there's no bruising, um, there's no obvious abnormalities in a CT or MRI or in a blood test that comes out. So that's the problem with diagnosing um, uh, concussions. So the mechanism now that we understand of uh, what happens with a um, concussion is that do you guys remember how when you look at the cerebrum, there's the gray matter and then the white matter? You guys remember that? So that represents all of the axons of, or so, that, so all the cell bodies are located in the gray matter. And then coming down, that represents all of the axons of those neurons. The gray matter and the white matter, because they're different densities, they accelerate at different speeds. So what happens is that when you have a high acceleration, the part of the brain that was accelerated shears because one, one area is moving faster than the other. And so if you can see in the slide, see how there's like sort of like a bending of the axons. What happens is that once the axons shear or bend, it creates um, a loss of that uh, electron potential, the gradient that we're gonna learn about next day. And so what happens is that the area of the brain that was accelerated all of those neurons in that area fire at once. Now, of all of the tissues in our body, so thing like lean mass uses up more energy than fat, for example, right? Of all of the tissues in our body, it's neurons that use the most energy because they have to keep this membrane potential because neurons work on electrical signals. So when you have a concussion, you have an area of the brain that's fired all of the electrons, and so, or so, all of the neurons. And so what the injury is in relation to is uh, energy loss in that part of the brain. And that's what a concussion is. Now, what happens is that when you have repeated concussions, you can get a buildup of calcium and that leads to degeneration of the areas where we have like PTSD or with multiple concussion, PTSD, uh, po sorry, uh, post PCS, post-concussive syndrome. Um, or when we have like the people that are like punch drunk or repeated concussions, where you have like long-term issues where you have brain degeneration. And Jessica had mentioned Dr. Bennett Omalu um, for CTE, and that's what happens. You get multiple concussions that were misdiagnosed, and then you have an additive effect of all of those injuries, and you ultimately have degeneration in parts of the brain, such as the basal ganglia. Here's just another example of where the injury is with a concussion. It happens where we have our axons. So we have the gray matter, going at a different speed or accelerating a different speed than the white matter, and then you get a shearing of the axon and ultimately a firing of all of the neurons in the area when that shouldn't happen. Now, in terms of research, um, a lot of, so much research has gone into concussions, understanding them. Me, as a physical therapist, um, we do a lot of concussion-based um, sort of rehab, and so that involves um, the areas of the brains that were injured, whether it be um, like neck pain, whether it be eye tracking issues, whether it be um, problems with blood flow, um, the rehab is for that particular patient is going to be based on the limitations of that patient. And the problem with concussions is that it's also have this has like multiple injuries happening at once. And so it's trying to tease out what areas to rehab. However, research has looked at different ways to sort of diagnose a concussion. Um, and so one of the um, most promising findings is trying to look for a chemical marker that would help um, allow practitioners to diagnose a concussion. And so there's different markers. 
And so these are the different ones. I mean, you don't need to know them for the midterm or anything, but these are the different things that they're looking at. They're looking at a way that they can now diagnose a concussion. Uh, Jessica is all about concussions, apparently. She says, we should watch the, yeah, we should watch the movie with Will Smith. It's a good one. It's good. And I felt that uh, that movie was actually fairly, um, like, real. Like, it wasn't, like, a, I felt like the information seemed fairly accurate. Now, with concussions, um, if you were to have, uh, has anyone had a concussion? Probably lots of you guys, right? I've had a concussion before. Um, perfect. So be kind of aware of what it feels like. Now, they've done studies on rats. If you have a concussion, if it properly heals, there is no additive effect of having a second concussion, right? It is when you have a concussion and get a second one before the first one is healed. That's when you have an additive effect. And that's when um, the, like, the degeneration of the brain happens. Yeah, sorry, Mohammed's laughing because I said perfect that everyone had a concussion. <laughs> perfect in that, you know, it helps allow us to learn better. Okay. So typically, um, within uh, when you look at the metabolites, um, the recovery, like so I work for a, a pro sports team uh, or have in the past. And um, what we do is we have to clear um, the athletes to go back into uh, the game or back from rehab when they're cleared to play again or cleared for contact or cleared to resume duties, right? Now, the problem is that People can have no symptoms, they can feel a lot better, but the energy in the brain is still decreased. So that means that they haven't fully recovered from their concussion, even though that they feel and are moving well. So that means that if we allow them to play and they get injured again, that means that it's gonna be a, a exponentially much greater injury. And so, Part of using those markers is to understand when the concussion, when the, when the person is properly healed from the concussion. Research typically shows that it takes about, even though the absence of symptoms, once someone gets a concussion, um, you need at least 14 days to 30 days to heal. So the guidelines of like, you have to wait, you get a concussion, you have to wait two weeks, that came from, um, from research. So this is part of the lecture too, where we would start like sort of discussing different stories. Um, it's because so much research is going out into concussions, but um, I guess you can do it over the chat if you want. Um, oh, oh, question. Uh, why is it when someone has a concussion, they are sensitive to light? Okay, well, there you go. So remember hat, um, I'll explain that. So a um, concussion is an energy drain. So think of the different symptoms that you all probably had for those of you that um, have a concussion. You have problems concentrating, you have problems exerting yourself, you have problems focusing, you have problems with reading, you have light sensitivity, uh, sound sensitivity, um, you can get dizzy. Those are the combinations of the different symptoms that you could have. Those are related to things that take a lot of brain energy. So for reading, for example, like reading off my phone, it's gonna be like me trying to focus on the different letters. That takes a lot more energy in using my eyes in the brain and so if my brain's already tired because of the concussion, now it inter now that's going to cause a problem. We have light sensitivity because you have to focus better or stronger when there's lots of light to better pick out the different objects. It's like your brain has to work harder when there's a bright light. So that's why it's um, that's why you're sensitive to light. So same thing with sounds. Um, is anyone uh, so other, the other thing with light is anyone that ever had a concussion where they had um, sensitivity to motion? We find that that's the biggest one. Let me just check the chat. So the reason why you have sensitivity to motion is because our peripheral vision is for seeing things in the periphery, whereas our central vision is for focusing in on objects. Focusing in on objects takes more energy. So after the concussion, our brain tends to try to utilize peripheral vision more, and it's okay at sort of getting us by up until sort of motion starts happening. And then because our peripheral vision is already being utilized, we get problems. So now everyone, if you guys can see the chat, everyone's discussing how they've gotten um, concussions. Um, 
So I would say that the concussions you see in the clinic, um, probably two thirds of them may be sports related, but the other ones are like falls and car accidents and work related stuff. Um, are you guys okay with uh, the material now? Okay, perfect. Um, we had one question. Uh, someone asked if they think that uh, the semester, winter semester courses will also be online. And just because the numbers are increasing, like I, we, I know as much as you guys do. So um, unfortunately, I think it's kind of the way that we're going. Um, so thank you for bearing with me as we try to figure out how to do this um, best virtually. I hope that um, this lecture was uh, informative enough for you to, to learn something. Please always feel free to email me um, and I will see you guys next week, okay? Any other questions before we go? Anyone have questions? Um, yes, this is being recorded and I will upload it to, uh, to Canvas. Okay, bye everyone, have a great day.